All right. If you have a Bible, could you please turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, and if you, if you don't, um, please listen along. And uh, we have what I hope will be for many of you a uh, word in season. Uh, I decided to preach this text a couple of weeks ago after a phone call with someone, I won't say who, um, and I, I just thought compelled to. And the reason for this is because we have a scripture text in 2 Corinthians 4 which applies the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, his resurrection from the dead, and it is applied in the life in ministry of the Apostle Paul, and then also it is applied to the Christians at the church at Corinth. And it has been preserved for us today as part of the Word of God. And it speaks clearly to the difficulties of life. And I know that means for some of you, for many of you, that means it's directly applicable to you right now. When you hear the word difficulty, affliction, discouragement, disappointment, you know exactly what that means to you. You know what you're going through and what you're experiencing. And for others, unfortunately, it's just a matter of time. So hold on to this and hold on to this text for that time. And so you might say, well, come on, John, it's Easter Sunday. Can't we have something happy? And I'll say, yes, the resurrection is happy news. It is happy news, but it's happy news only because it is tied to the most well-known death in history. The resurrection is inescapably weighty. There is nothing superficial or flippant about Christ's resurrection from the dead. And so therefore, for the Christian, the resurrection of Christ makes life worth living, causes suffering to have perspective, and death to not be the end. So we do not lose heart. I love that phrase, right? So, life worth living, suffering to have perspective, and death to not be the end. And so therefore, now in this life, we do not lose heart. So let's hear from verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 4. This is the word of the, God, word of the living God. The Apostle Paul writes, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is the word of the living God. Second Corinthians has a context where the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth, and these people have, in some senses, been taken up with the teachings of Paul's critics, right? Some will call them the super apostles. And here's the criticism that Paul faces. Paul, your life, your ministry, it is filled with suffering, failure, disappointment, and affliction. Therefore, based on appearances... You're not really a genuine servant of God. Right? Paul, you're not living your best life now. Amen? 
Hillsong, okay, Hillsong are not paying Paul $150,000 a year to preach for them. Anyway, uh, sorry, an appearance, $150,000 an appearance. Anyway, I'm in the wrong line of ministry, ma'am. Um, anyway, but that's the, that's the criticism. Hey, you don't seem to be thriving. You seem to be struggling. You seem to be suffering. Therefore, you're not a true servant of God. And at the end of the letter, this is wonderful. If you get to uh, the Second Corinthians 11, it starts in verse 23. Paul mentions that he's been stoned, right, with, with rocks. He's been imprisoned. He's been shipwrecked three times. He's experienced hunger and thirst, cold and nakedness, danger and death. Paul's response to his critics is that he agrees with them. That's a wonderful place to be. Yeah, this is the way you are. And he says, yep, true, absolutely. He agrees with the assessment of his circumstances, but he then disagrees with their conclusion that he is not really a genuine servant of God. And the reason for that is because his critics have fundamentally misunderstood that suffering and affliction have a place in this lifetime, especially for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. His critics have got the wrong perspective. Paul is saying, no, my afflictions and disappointments are not taken away completely right now. In fact, I'm actually suffering for Christ's sake. And he's going to keep proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in spite of hardship. And he's seeking to encourage all those that struggle in life and suffer for their faith and suffer due to their circumstances. And so twice in the 2 Corinthians 4, as he's talking about his ministry, he says something very beautiful. He says, we do not lose heart. He says it at the beginning in verse 1, and he says it there at the end in verse 16. We do not lose heart. What does that mean? There's a question that we ask ourselves every day multiple times, even if we don't use these words. We say, is it worth it? It's a value question. Is it worth it? We all ask ourselves, should I get up and go do that thing? Is it worth it? Should I decide to? Should I work towards it? Should I? We ask ourselves. We ask ourselves in the future, will it be worth it if I do these things? And if it's not, if we decide it's not worth it, we tend to give up. And in an ultimate big sense, we could say we lose heart. Living life, living the Christian life, is it worth it? If we decide it's not, we lose heart and we give up. Many people know verses 16 to 18 in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 here, right? They're somewhat famous verses. Um, not sort of Psalm 23 well-known, but they're, they're, they're well-known in a sense, but they don't remember what comes before, because right before Paul starts saying, we do not lose heart, and our outer self is wasting away, right before that he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so therefore he is applying its importance, right? So what? What does the resurrection do? And the resurrection, really, the answer is, is it changes everything. It absolutely changes everything. And he quotes, there in verse 13, Psalm 116, which we read for our call to worship. I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak. Facing affliction, David, the psalmist, trust God. He says, I believed, and he trusts in God's deliverance, and so he speaks of it. Very simple. Paul interprets the psalm Christocentrically. Christ is the one also who has gone through affliction. Christ is the one who has been saved from his affliction and his suffering by being raised from the dead. Paul and his fellow ministers therefore believe in God, they trust in God because of this Lord Jesus Christ, and so they continue to speak. 
They continue to profess the name of Christ. They continue to minister. They continue to go through hardship. They continue to live the Christian life because they're following in the footsteps of their Lord. He tells them that there is hope for the future because Christ is risen. That's so crucial. Christ is risen. Elsewhere, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, in verse 16, he says, here's the alternative. The alternative is this. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ is being raised. And if Christ is not being raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. I.e., go home, have a party, do whatever, but everything's a waste of time. If Christ is not being raised, everything is a gigantic waste waste of time. Nothing has any real meaning. Nothing has any real purpose and you're still in your sins and there's a there's no hope for you. But because Christ has been raised, the resurrection is so crucial, it changes everything. And the first thing it simply changes is our outlook on life, right? The, our life is impacted by the resurrection. And so in verses 15 and 16, he starts speaking about that resurrection and what it means for our lives and God's purposes. Do you know that the resurrection was once unnecessary in this life? It was once unnecessary our first parents walked, we believe, without death, without sin, in relationship with God. There was no need for the resurrection. God creates matter. He creates Adam and Eve with rational bodies and souls and in his image. And he declares the creation very good. It's a judgment. It's a judgment of God. Very good. They're without shame, they're without guilt, they're without sort of any sort of fear of evil and harming one another. And yet Paul says in first second Corinthians four, verse sixteen, he says, Our outer self is wasting away. Adam and Eve did not feel that initially, that wasting away. Elsewhere, Paul uses earlier, he says, he uses the languages of jars of clay, which is not just a 90s Christian band. That comes, comes from uh, this text, jars of clay. It says, our bodies are temporary. All right? Our outer self is wasting away. It's talking about a body. It's like a, it's like a jar of clay. It's, just, it's, uh, it's just something that's temporary and it has a use-by date. And we feel that. Amen? Amen. We've got a use-by date. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, God tells Adam, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That's where death comes from. In Ezekiel 18.20, we're told such a simple summary. The soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall die. And we've been wasting away ever since. And it doesn't matter how hard we try to stop that. It doesn't matter how many creams or workout programs or protein powders or whatever it is that we can come up to extend our lives. It doesn't matter. We can slow aging down, but we certainly can't stop death. It comes for us all. And that is where the resurrection becomes necessary. There is death in Adam, but there is life in the second Adam, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes into 
our history. Heaven created it, we're told in Colossians 1. He created all things, were created through the Son. He comes into human history in what we call the incarnation, which is celebrated at Christmas. I'm not sure if that's going to get celebrated this year and still be a public holiday, but we hope it is, okay? We'll do it anyway. But what happens at Christmas? What, what, what happens there? What, what are we thinking of? The incarnation. Christ the Son of God takes upon himself sinless human flesh. Truly God, truly man. The incarnation means he becomes like us. Like us in his life. Born under the law. Born to obey God. Born to live a perfect life. He lives that perfect life. Voluntarily gives up his own life in our place for our sins. Because remember, the soul who sins shall die. Well, the wonders of the cross is that the soul that did not sin dies in the place of the soul which did sin. And the souls of those who did sin. Christ gave himself up for our sins. But he did not remain dead because he was raised on the third day as vindication of his victory. Christ defeated death the day that he died. People think that the, the, the cross of Christ was defeat and the resurrection is the victory. Hey, no, the cross was the victory. He defeated death in the words of John Owen, the death of death and the death of Christ. Amen? It kills it. He kills death. The resurrection on the third day was the vindication, the showing forth of that victory. Therefore, there is now one who is like us, body and soul, but without sin, that we might trust in, a representative, unlike Adam, because this representative is without sin, and he can stand in our place. This Christ is the one in whom we are called to trust. This Christ is the king in whom we are called to live under. This Christ is the priest to bring, the great high priest who brings us to God. This Christ is the one who speaks a better word, a word not of condemnation to us, but a word of salvation. Believe in what I have done and be saved. One preacher, a preacher once said, the resurrection means, the incarnation means he became like us, the resurrection means we'll become like him. We don't become God but we do become sinless, glorified people forever in a new creation. The resurrection is necessary. The resurrection presents a, to us a Savior who gives grace, who gives good gifts to his people. He gives gifts to his people who are sinful but also loved. And therefore, in that, because of this resurrection, Paul says in verse 15, it says, For it's all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. God's purpose for you is laid down in that verse. God's purpose for your life is that you would come to him, that you would submit to him, that you would trust in him, his provision of his son, Jesus Christ, and that you would then live to him under his grace and live your life as a life of thanksgiving to him. Increasing thanksgiving to the glory of God. When we love God, and when we love neighbor as self, his image bearers, we're living lives of thanksgiving for the salvation that is given. It is that that is the purpose of God, and it is that which is going to keep spreading in this world. That's the purpose. God is rescuing a fallen creation from itself 
and from his own judgment through his son. The resurrection brings purpose to life. And that's what Paul is able to say, though our outer self is wasting away. What does he say there in verse 16? He says, our inner self is being renewed day by day. We're getting older. We're falling apart. We're struggling. We're suffering. And yet there's in the midst of that, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, renewal and life going on within us, for those that belong to him, and so that therefore that will not be the end and it will continue forever. That we will receive new bodies. Renewal in this life, everlasting life, which begins now, and therefore eternal life. It is eternal. It doesn't end. And that's what we'll talk about that when we get to the part on death. The resurrection brings purpose to life. It brings hope. It shows that life is not meaningless. Life has purpose because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, in our suffering, look in verse 17. The suffering, the resurrection impacts suffering. Now, some people might be almost offended to hear this. In verse 17, he says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Paul certainly suffered. And Paul takes the suffering and affliction, and he says, All that we suffer is preparing us for glory. And you might say, Really? Light, poor, light, light affliction. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. How dare you? And maybe that doesn't describe you right now. It says, I'm not going through any light momentary affliction. Everything's good. Well, that's the human experience. Paul does not say light momentary affliction to make you dismiss what you're going through. He's not doing that. He's not doing that. He's not dismissing. He's not saying grit your teeth and just move on. He's not saying what you've been through, what you've experienced doesn't matter. It is a comparison. It is a comparison. Light momentary affliction is compared to eternal weight of glory. That's what's going on here. Momentary is compared to eternal. Light is compared to weighty. And affliction is compared to glory. It is a value judgment. And so Paul is saying that even the worst of affliction and suffering that we face in this life compared to what is to come because of the resurrection, there is no comparison. It is light, it is momentary affliction, and it is compared to an eternal weight of glory. Meaning that those that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ 10,000 years into the new heavens and earth will look back at all the horrible things that they faced and saw and experienced in this life and be like, God has been good. God has been great. God has outdone himself, truly. That is but a distant memory. The things consuming my life right now are but a distant memory in comparison to the eternality of the glory that is for me. That's what the resurrection does. Our pain does often not feel temporary. Some of you suffer every day. Some of you wake up and something bad is on your mind and you go to sleep and that same thing is on your mind and you're sleeping and you're struggling to sleep because that thing is on your mind. 
And Paul, with the utmost of care, is able to say to you, light momentary affliction. Because that's a call to compare. Not to dismiss, but to compare. Weigh it. Weigh it against that on God's scales. And you see the weight, the goodness is going to far outweigh everything bad. Job. I'm always struck in the story of Job by the fact that he never knew why he suffered. He never knew. But he praised. And in Job 19, verse 25, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Job knew that there would be a resurrection of the dead, that his outer self would continue to waste away, And he would see God in his flesh, that he would be raised. Job believed in the promises of God. This resurrection, therefore, brings perspective, and it allows us to compare on God's scales. And then here, our life, our suffering, and our death. The resurrection impacts the way that we die And he says in verse 18, We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. There's a lot to unpack there, and I'm not going to to do that. But the inevitability of wasting away, of death, of decay, of affliction is real. And Paul is saying, That which we see... In our outer selves, it's transient. It has, it has an end. It's not meant to be forever. But if all that we see is all that there is, we're in trouble. The resurrection changes that because the risen Christ who rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of majesty on high, he is the one who is unseen. The resurrection was seen by eyewitnesses, and now the risen Christ is unseen, but he says we are to look at that which is unseen through the eyes of faith. We should not, and we do not need to hide from death because for those that trust Christ are wasting away, it is not the final word. Our death is not the final word. If you get the opportunity to go to a graveside service after a funeral. If you get the opportunity to go to the graveside service and watch the body, the casket be lowered into the ground, it is worth doing. It is hard, it is heavy, but it is worth doing because then we can recall those words, death is not the end. This body shall be raised and stand in front of its maker. And for those that die in Christ, glory awaits. If the resurrection is not true, suffering is comparatively hellish, and life is simply brutal with the finish line of death at the end. But because of the resurrection, that's not the full story. God resurrects body and soul. And there is an eternal weight of glory for those who trust in him. Death is not the end. And so, what we need to do as we trust in Christ, and this is something that we want to try and model as a church, and it's why we're not doing a happy, fluffy Easter Sunday sermon, is we live in tension. We really do. Tension between the already and the not yet. Many people want to be very triumphalistic about everything, right? 
They have an overrealized understanding of how close to the end that we are and how close we are to the fullness of the kingdom of God. And they want to be triumphalistic, that everything is pumping and good and, and no one should talk about things that are hard and difficult and suffering. Because in that, why? The Christian life is to be meant to live on a high. And that's really what the Apostle Paul's critics were saying to him and saying to others. But there's a danger and then this tension that we then underrealize. We underrealize. There is suffering, okay? There is suffering. There is outer self wasting away. There is light momentary affliction. But then on the other side, we shouldn't be defeatist. We should not be defeatist. We should not just run away. We should not just give up. Why do, like, seriously, why try and in this time evangelize and plant churches and do ministry when the government doesn't even know what a woman is? Like, like, what? Like, let's just hide away in a little Christian commune and do that thing. No, we should not be defeatist because Christ is risen from the grave. That's the last word, not anything else anyone else says. Because Paul says in verse 15, he says, as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. He's saying grace is going to extend to more and more people and increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. That's what we're called to do. That's how we're called to live. That's a good call because it is the resurrection of the grave. It's true. If that's true, we should do that. We shouldn't be defeatist. We don't need to be fake and triumphalistic, but we also don't need to just shy away and cry. Hold these things in tension. God's purposes will be accomplished, but they're accomplished through suffering. Three quick points of application using this text. Paul says, no. Verse 14. No, knowing, know the resurrection. He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring us with you into his presence. He raised Jesus. He will raise all who belong to him. The resurrection is a fact. 2,000 years on a hill outside of Jerusalem, Christ died. He was buried. He was buried. He was looked after by Roman gods at his tomb, and that tomb is empty. They don't have the bones. They won't ever find them because he rose from the grave, and he appeared to at least 500 eyewitnesses. The resurrection is true. It cannot be wound back. And those of you that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to... Go disprove the resurrection. That's, like, that's my challenge. Just go look into it. Look into it. If it's true, then you need to absolutely bow your knee and submit to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and live for Him. But if it's not, then who cares? But for the rest of us, in the words of D.A. Carson, if we know the resurrection, you're not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. Amen? Secondly, look. Paul says in verse 18, as we look to the things that are unseen, if we look at only what we do see, we are defeated. But if we look to that which is unseen in the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't lose heart. We don't see a body in the tomb because he ascended. Because he rose and he ascended to glory. We see, we look to that which is unseen, we see the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel through the eyes of faith. Through the eyes of faith. Prize it. He says, Paul, at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says in verse 18, We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're given, we are given 
means of grace, such as the Lord's Supper, his body broken, his blood poured out, because we are weak. So he allows us, through the eyes of faith, to behold the glory of the gospel, and allows us and helps us to look upon our unseen Lord and see him by faith. And lastly, know the resurrection. Look with eyes of faith. Lastly, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. A wonderful pastor that I know said this, the world desperately needs the Easter message. We live in a world that is frantically searching for security, meaning, peace, and contentment. And the world looks for it in self-esteem, in relationships, in money, in sex, and so much more. It'll never do. It'll never do. The promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not tied to your health, to your wealth, or to your success. The promise of the gospel is tied to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the faithfulness of God. And that is why we cannot lose heart. We give up when we think things are not worth it. We lose heart. But, because of the resurrection, all of life, suffering, and death is imparted with the deepest possible meaning the resurrection of Christ. Therefore, Paul will say, don't lose heart because Christ has risen from the grave. Amen? Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for that resurrection, for our justification. And as we come now to your table, let us come with glad and grateful hearts, with thanksgiving that you are the one who has triumphed and therefore you are the one who gives grace. Grant us the grace to live the Christian life and grant the grace that those that don't know you would see your beauty and see your your nail-pierced hands and see that you are the one who wants the best for them. Draw us to yourselves by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.